Welcome to the second part of the English Syntax and Universal Grammar. My name is Hector Campos from Georgetown University. In our previous program, we saw four different topics. First, we discussed what is linguistics, and we drew a very important distinction between what we called e-language and i-language. And we concluded that uh, linguists are interested in making a model for i-language using e-language as the window to i-language. Then we gave an example of the scientific method, and we saw that the way that we work in linguistics is that we start with data. From the data, we draw a hypothesis. We provide evidence for that hypothesis, we make predictions, then we verify the predictions, and if the predictions are right, then we let it stand. If the predictions are not right, then we need to start again, collect more data, and come up with a new hypothesis. Then we talked about the different areas of linguistics, and we proposed that there were two main areas, what we called core linguistics and applied linguistics. For core linguistics, we saw that uh, we could divide that into three main areas, what we called sound, form, and meaning. And for the part of sound, we said that phonetics and phonology study that part of linguistics. Uh, the part of form, that's where we have morphology and syntax. And then for meaning, we have semantics and pragmatics. Finally, we talked about linguistics and the other sciences, and we said then that linguistics was actually part of psychology, psychology was part of biology, and biology was part of physics. And this is also why we use the scientific method. Today, we are going to talk about a central problem in theoretical linguistics, and this is what we know as Plato's Paradox. To Plato's Paradox. I want you to repeat after me so that you learn this important paradox. How come we know so much with so little evidence? Let's put it together. How come we know so much with so little evidence? How come we know so much with so little evidence? This is going to be the central question in theoretical linguistics. We're going to be trying to answer uh, these, uh, this question as we move along the course. Let's start with uh, Plato's paradox, discussing our knowledge of phonetics and phonology. Remember that phonetics was the area of linguistics that concerned itself with the production of sounds. Uh, it's interesting to see that when babies uh, hear the mother's language, uh, they remain quiet. And it doesn't have to be the mother who speaks the language, it can be someone else. So this is a baby that is just born, days old, and the baby can already detect the mother's language, even if it's not the mother that is speaking the language. Um, also, notice that children, even before they go to school, they can detect foreign accents. Uh, if you're a foreigner and you're trying to speak a language and then children, without knowing anything about language or linguistics, uh, they can know that you have a foreign accent. How is that possible? So this is Plato's paradox. How do we know that? How do the children learn that if they haven't had any formal training in linguistics? Um, when it comes to phonology, notice that any native speaker has uh, a, a knowledge of the different processes that occur in the language. So, for example, in English, uh, we form a plural typically by adding an S or an IS or ES. Uh, so, for example, you have cat, then plural would be cats, we pronounce that as an S. Uh, we have dog, then plural would be dogs, we pronounce that as a Z. And then if you have a word like judge, then notice that the plural would be judges. So, if you're not a foreign, if you're not a native speaker of uh, English, you have to learn this rule. And it takes a little while to actually master uh, the rule. Even advanced speakers of Vietnamese, for example, 
have not mastered the system and it's very hard for them to pronounce that ending on the words now when you do this with uh, children you give them uh, a nonsense word like the word wug for example children know uh, what the plural is even though this word does not exist so notice that we cannot say that we learn a language by imitation because in this case the word wug does not exist yet the child knows uh, how to use the rule and correctly produce the word wugs now we're going to watch a clip with uh, Jean Berko Gleason. Hi, I'm going to show you some pictures, okay? It's called the Wug Test, and Jean still uses the original card she designed half a century ago. This is a Wug. They showed that even with nonsense words they've never heard before, children can use grammatical rules that they've somehow absorbed. What are they? You tell me. Wug. Say that louder? Wugs. Wugs yeah. is great. Very, very good. Very good. Okay. This is a man who knows how to bing. He's binging. He did the same thing yesterday. What did he do yesterday? Yesterday he... Bing. Binged. Very nice. Yeah. Here is a man who knows how to zib. So what is he doing? He is... Zib. Zibbing. Zibbing. Very good. What would you call a man whose job is to zib? He has to do it every day. His job is to zip. So he's a... Zipper. Mm, very, very, very good. So in that recording, we see a three or four year old girl producing forms of words that do not exist. For example, for the word wug, and this is the wug test, remember? Uh, she made the correct plural. The plural would be wugs. And then for the two verbs that do not exist either, bing and zib, she produced the ing form correctly. So she said binging and zibbing correctly. And also for the verb zib, she knew that the noun that corresponds to that verb is actually the form zibber. So Plato's paradox comes into play again. How did the girl learn those rules or learn those forms if she had not been taught those forms. Those words do not exist. That is Plato's paradox. Now let's look at uh, more examples of morphology uh, that show uh, Plato's paradox. Uh, every native speaker knows what is and what is not a possible word in the language. So let's take for example uh, the word blinch. You know that the verb blinch does not exist in your language. However, let me ask you, and you can stop the recording here, what is the past tense of blinch? What would you say the past tense for blinch is? I'll give you one minute and then we'll continue the discussion. Well, regarding the verb blinch, you probably said that the past tense of blinch is blinched, and you probably pronounce it correctly with a T. Um, that is very interesting, and that needs an explanation, because notice that we have verbs like begin, began, and verbs like, for example, uh, sing and sang, yet you didn't say that the past tense of blinch was blanch. Why not? So why did you actually put an ED on blinch and concluded that, and actually you also knew that it was pronounced like a T? So this is Plato's paradox. You see, you do things automatically regarding language, and you don't know why you do them. So let's take now a more contemporary example. Look at the picture. Here we have two, two what? Right, to mice. So the plural of mouse is actually mice. Now, look at this picture. What do we have? We have two, mm, even though this is also a mouse, we have here two mouses. 
So in this case, we use the regular plural, mouses, as opposed to mice. That's exactly what the child is doing with the word blinch. Instead of going to blanch, which is an extra rule, a special rule, what we call an irregular verb, notice that the child uses the regular form. That's exactly what you did with the word mouse. So in this case, when we say mouses, uh, you're applying the general rule. And if you say mice, notice that with the word mice, you have to learn that that's a special form for the plural of the word mouse. Let's not now look at an example from morphology. In English, we have two ways that we can express the way that we do things as someone else. And we use the terms isation or ification. Now, imagine you want to say you do something the way that Trump did it, or you do something the way that Clinton did it. Now, which form would you use? For Trump? Hmm. For Trump, you would probably use Trumpification. Notice that this is what happens with a word like pure or brute. Notice that we do say purification. Now, in the case of Clinton, you probably would say Clintonization. Notice that if we have hospital, we would say hospitalization. Now, you probably knew the rule. You knew that in the case of Trump, you would use ification. But in the case of Clinton, you would use the word isation. Now, how did you learn that rule? Did someone teach you that rule? You just knew the answer. Well, that's exactly Plato's paradox. You know what you know, and you don't know why you know it. You just know it. That's Plato's paradox. How come we know so much with so little evidence? Now, in this case, notice that you were applying a rule that was probably unconscious for you, and the rule is very simple. If the word has one syllable, you use ification. If the word has more than one syllable, then you use isation. That's the rule that you were using, but you didn't know you were using that rule. Let's now watch this uh, clip uh, about Alice in Wonderland and see what we get here. Listen carefully. Now, where in the world do you suppose that... Loon something? Oh! <laughs> I, I was no, no I, I I mean I I was just wondering. Oh, that's quite all right. Uh, <clears throat> one moment, please. Ooh. Second chorus. I was brilliant and the slithy toves did the guy and the gimbel in the way. But why, why you're a cat? A Cheshire cat, all a mimsy. Oh, the oh. So this poem is called Jabberwocky, was written by Lewis Carroll in 1881, and you are going to tell me what part of speech these words are. So notice that here's the poem. Was brillig and the slithy toves, did gyre and gimble in the wabe, all nimsy were the borough groves, and the moam wraths outgrave. Now, all the words that are blackened in the, uh, in the poem are words that do not exist. Notice that the author invented these words. However, even though these words do not exist, we do know what category they are. We know if they are verbs or they are nouns. So let's take, for example, the word number two. Toves. Is that an adjective, a noun, or a verb? Yeah, you probably guessed right. That's a noun. And how do we know that that's a noun? Well, because probably slithy is an adjective. But how did you know that slithy is an adjective if the word does not exist? You see? So automatically 
your mind is assigning categories to these words and these words do not exist. Now we go back to Plato's paradox. How did we learn that? Well, we just know it, even though these words do not exist. So let's now look at some examples about syntax or knowledge of syntactic knowledge. Every speaker knows what is acceptable and non-acceptable in their language. So every speaker knows when a sentence is good and when a sentence is not good. So for example, in English, if I say, John eats rice, every speaker knows that this is a good sentence. But if I say, John rice eats, then notice that this is a bad sentence, that the order is wrong. Now, of course, when we study syntax, we want to explain this. We want to explain why number one is good, but number two is bad. However, if we give the same sentence number two to a Japanese speaker, we would say something like, John wa gohan o tabemasu. Notice that in this case, we are saying John rice eat, and the sentence is perfectly good in Japanese. So this is going to be the challenge that we're going to have in this course. How are we going to write a grammar that is going to be able to explain why number two is wrong in English but number three is good in Japanese and the other way around too why number one is good in English and if we put that in the same order in Japanese that is also going to give us a bad sentence so we see that the, the challenge that we're going to have here is trying to come up with a system that is going to explain why in English we have one order and then in Japanese, we have a different order. Notice that the problem is not necessarily going to go to Japanese. Let's take another example. Let's take, for example, in English, you say, I finished eating already. So, I finished eating already. Okay, you have two verbs, finish eating. Uh, and if you say this in the opposite order, if you say, I eating finished, this is bad in English. Okay, so notice that uh, what we call here the, the, the temporary uh, word uh, has to go first. So we say we finish eating, the main verb goes last, and then the one that decides whether is complete or not complete goes first. Okay, so we need to explain that. Now, you don't have to go to Japanese to find the opposite example. So you take, for example, uh, Vietnamese. In Vietnamese, you would say something like to an som roi. No, notice that you have an som roi. And then in this case, you're saying I eat Finnish already. You're saying exactly the opposite of what you're saying uh, in English in terms of word order. Yet the sentence is perfectly okay in Vietnamese and the sentence is not acceptable in English. So, again, this is going to be the challenge that we're going to have for our system. We need to explain why that order in five is wrong in English, but is perfectly good in Vietnamese. So, the challenge is, how do we create a model for universal grammar? Remember that we want to create a model for universal grammar that can allow for the variation shown by English and Japanese and Vietnamese at the same time. Now, let's look at another example in English. We're going to look at uh, relative clauses. Imagine that we, I give you two sentences. So I say, the boys came, and we saw the boys. And then I ask you to put sentence number two inside sentence number one. And I'm showing that in the sentence after that. So how would you do that relative clause? Now, the way you do that is you take the first sentence, and then you simply erase the element that is repeated in the second sentence and you include that there and you would say the boys we saw came right that's the way you would embed the second sentence into the first sentence or if you want you could even put a pronoun there you could say the boys that we saw the boys whom we saw the boys who we saw came all these are correct answers okay so in english then what we do is we take the second sentence and we scratch out the part that is repeated and then we insert it 
in the first sentence. Well, let's try that again. So here we have number four, professors teach and directors hire professors. So what we want to do is we want to keep this number sentence number four first. So we are going to keep professors teach and we are going to insert sentence five in uh, sentence four. So we follow the same procedure that we did before. So we have professors teach and then directors hire professors. Professors is the element that is being repeated. Now we're going to insert then the part that is left in the middle and we get this sentence. Professors, directors hire teach. And that's a bad sentence. So what's happening here? The previous sentence was good and this sentence is bad. Uh, however, if we put a pronoun, if we say professors that directors hire, or professors whom directors hire, or professors who directors hire, teach, then the sentence becomes good. So what's interesting here is 7a. Why is 7a ungrammatical? Well, is it unacceptable? Speakers do not like sentence 7a. So here we have an interesting uh, paradox, right? So why, if we say the boys we saw came is good, and when we have the second case, uh, professors, directors, higher teach, that does not work. Now, every speaker, and if you're a good uh, speaker of English as a second language, notice that you know that the second sentence is bad. Plato's paradox, again, comes to mind, right? How did we learn that? How did we learn that number one would be good, but the second sentence would not be good? Okay, let's try now the same sentences in Vietnamese. Number one. Những cậu bé đã đến. Number two. Chúng tôi thấy những cậu bé. Number three. Những cậu bé đã đến. So, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to insert sentence number two into sentence number one. And this is what we show in number three. The procedure that we follow is exactly the same procedure that we follow in English. So you have sentence number one, you have sentence number two, you scratch out the element that is repeated and you insert the element from sentence number two into sentence number one and you get the result Những cậu bé chúng tôi thấy đã đến. Notice that if we include a relative pronoun, then the sentence is also good. Những cậu bé người mà chúng tôi thấy đã đến. So, this works exactly the same way as in English. Basically, we take the second sentence, we insert that into the first sentence, eliminating the part that is repeated, and if we want, we can use the relative pronoun. Let's try this with another example in Vietnamese. Let's take number four and number five. Number four. Những giáo sư dạy học. Number five. Những giám đốc thuê những giáo sư. And number six. Những giáo sư dạy học. So, number six is basically number four, but we're going to try to insert sentence number five into sentence number four. So we follow the same procedure that we did before. We have sentence number four, we have sentence number five, we scratch out the words that are repeated, in this case it would be the teacher, and we try to insert the uh, second sentence into the first sentence. And we get this result. Những giáo sư, những giám đốc thuê dạy học. Notice that if you are a speaker of Vietnamese, you probably don't like this sentence. You find that this sentence is unacceptable or ungrammatical. But if you are a native speaker of Vietnamese and then you use a relative pronoun, then you probably like the sentence better. Những giáo sư, người mà những giám đốc thuê dạy học. Do you like sentence B better than sentence A? If you do, that is something that we need to explain. So, notice that we have observed that English and Vietnamese behave similarly. Now, the question is why? 
Notice that in the case of English, if we took the examples, the boys came, we saw the boys, the boys we saw came is good, but if we took a similar example, professors teach, directors hire professors, we cannot get something like professors, directors hire teach. And then if we try the equivalent examples in Vietnamese, the examples are exactly the same. What is good in English is good in Vietnamese, and what is bad in English is bad in Vietnamese, even though the procedures are exactly the same in the two languages. So Plato's paradox, again, is at play right here. Why is the first sentence good in the two languages, and why is the second sentence bad in the two languages if we are doing exactly, exactly the same process? This is Plato's paradox, and every speaker of English and every speaker of Vietnamese knows this. So the question is, how did we learn this? Did someone teach you that this is not the way to say a sentence in Vietnamese or in English? The answer is probably nobody taught you. You know the answer. This is Plato's paradox. So the question we need to answer then is why do English and Vietnamese behave similarly? What is good in one language is good in the other language. What is bad in one language is bad in the other language. Uh, this is something then that probably has to do something with our computing system rather than with the language itself. Our computing system fails us both in English and in Vietnamese at the same point. And again, this is very similar to asking the questions. Why do we have two hands? Why do we have two eyes? Why do we have one nose? You see, this is just the way it comes. This is the way we are. Or, why do we see the world in three dimensions? We know that some animals, for example, see the world in two dimensions, and some animals may see it in more dimensions. So, but why do we see it in three dimensions? Again, this is the way we are. Or, why do other humans behave like we do? This is the way we are programmed to behave because we are humans. This is the way we are programmed to talk because we are humans. Now, let's look at some more examples of syntactic knowledge. Notice that speakers can detect ambiguity, and you probably can detect ambiguity too. So imagine that I say, he's an old Vietnamese teacher. How many readings can you get in this? Is this sentence ambiguous? And if it is ambiguous, why is it ambiguous? Well, it's ambiguous because we can have a person who teaches Vietnamese and he's old, or we can have a person who teaches old Vietnamese, or we can have someone who teaches something and we don't know what, and he's old and he's Vietnamese. Or we can have something that someone who has been teaching Vietnamese for a long time. So he's an old Vietnamese teacher. Now, this sentence, he's an old Vietnamese teacher, is four times ambiguous. Now, it may take us some time to actually see that ambiguity, but we know that this sentence is ambiguous. So the question is, well, how did we learn that this sentence is ambiguous? That's also Plato's paradox. We know that it is ambiguous. And this is connected to what we call visual ambiguity. So if I show you this picture, for example, it may be the first time that you see this picture, just exactly as it was the first time that you saw the other sentence, yet you know that this picture here is ambiguous. What do you see? Well, you see a vase, a white vase, with a black background, or you see two black faces uh, facing each other with a white background. Okay, So this is visual ambiguity. Probably this is the first time that you see this, and you see that this is ambiguous. Now, I'm going to show you another picture. This one is a little bit harder. What do you see here? This one is hard. Some people see an old woman 
and this old woman is looking to the left and she has a very big nose she's probably very poor she's very ugly and uh, she has uh, this scarf over her head however this is also ambiguous and you also have a very pretty young woman and she has a very small nose and she's very elegant and she's looking more to the back now this picture is also ambiguous now the second picture is a little harder to see so if you don't see it keep on practicing stop the recording until you see it and if you don't see it don't worry it took me a long time to actually see the ambiguity in this picture now the same question that we are asking about language is relevant here these pictures are ambiguous who taught us that these pictures are ambiguous nobody taught us yet we know and everybody who sees these pictures sees the ambiguity why is that how can we explain the fact that this is ambiguous so the question is going to be how did we learn to detect ambiguities who taught us that these things were ambiguous and here we saw a very interesting parallel between what we called syntactic ambiguity and visual ambiguities now what is interesting here is that normally when we see uh, it sounds stupid to say that we learn to see basically we see we don't learn to see however when it comes to language we make a big issue out of uh, we learn a language actually we don't learn the language we just talk so notice that the same way that we can just see because this is part of uh, being human it's also part of being human the fact that we talk so talking and seeing should be treated in a parallel way now the way that we know that one thing is ambiguous visually or syntactically uh, is another example of Plato's paradox because nobody taught us that these things were ambiguous and yet we knew the answer that these were ambiguous let's look at one more example this is what we call invisible or silent elements if I say John promised Susan to study hard who is studying hard so I represent that with an X John or Susan in this case notice that the person who's studying hard is John now if I say John told Susan to study hard again who is that X in the sentence in this case the answer is Susan so again every speaker of English knows that the X in these two sentences even though it's not there we pronounce nothing there in the first case we interpret that as John and in the second case we interpret that as Susan now how do we learn that and how do we always have the correct answer in this case notice that in the previous example we were seeing or we were interpreting invisible things well here is the same everyone sees two triangles in this case but notice that we actually have only one triangle and the other triangle the one that you see in the front is actually an illusion it's not there hmm? so is that triangle really there no all we have done is we have cut a little piece of each circle and then a part of the triangle and then our minds automatically see a triangle in that case even though the triangle is not there so Plato's paradox again how did we learn to see or to hear invisible elements well nobody taught us we just know that we have something invisible there and everybody sees it and everybody interprets that this is Plato's paradox we just know because we know finally let's look at an example 
of Plato's paradox in the domain of semantics and pragmatics. I'm going to read you a text and we will see how you react. Okay, so this is the text. Shortly after I got married, I got bored of eating rice. Since I had to eat, I went to look for pho. Unfortunately, a man like me has a hard time finding delicious pho. That's life. You pay for good things. Unexpectedly, while I was eating cha, my wife also got bored and went to eat spring rolls every day. Now, if you give this to anybody who is not Vietnamese, they will find this kind of boring, uh, uninteresting. But if you give this to a Vietnamese person and you give it in English, some Vietnamese people will laugh and will find it funny, others will not react. Let's see what happens when we do the same text in Vietnamese. See how you react. Không lâu sau khi cưới, tôi chán cơm, nhưng tôi vẫn phải ăn chứ. Thế là tôi đi tìm phở. Rất tiếc một người như tôi khó mà tìm được phở ngon. Đời là vậy, tôi đành phải bóc bánh trả tiền. Không ngờ trong lúc tôi ăn trả, thì vợ tôi cũng chán hàng ngày đi ăn nem. So, what happened in that last case? Well, notice that we have language and we have culture actually helping us interpret and understand uh, this text. So again, this is how semantics and pragmatics get together. And here we also have an element of culture coming into play because if you belong to this Vietnamese culture, you understand the sort of the double meaning that we have uh, in some words, in particular words of uh, food, like in this case. To finish our presentation today, let's watch a video about sound. Many of us have become quick to catch illusions that trick our eyes, but how often do you consider illusions of the ear? Are you really able to trust your ears and the things they hear? For example, listen to Greg speaking. Bar, 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 bar. What do you hear? If you heard bar, 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 you'd be right. But how about now? Bar, 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 bar. Chances are you heard far, far, far this time with an F, except you didn't. In fact, the audio didn't even change between the two videos. Bar, bar, bar. Strange as it may seem, what you hear depends on which video you're looking at. Go ahead, take turns watching each video and see how the sound morphs. Bar, bar, bar. This is a perfect example of something called the McGurk effect, which shows how our visuals can alter what we believe we're hearing. Now I want you to count how many times you see a circle flash on screen. Let's do that one more time. Did you see it flash twice? Many people do, yet without the sound, it becomes clear that the circle is only flashing once. In this case, the sound has altered your perceived vision. And uh, here is the last video for this presentation. However, I don't want you just to watch this for fun. I want you to think about what am I trying to I always to like to come out here and I like to talk about how much we have uh, in common more than we, we are different. And uh, it doesn't matter what your politics are. It doesn't matter your, your race or religion. Here at The Ellen Show, we all come together as one, except for the people in the riffraff room. They're separate. But, um, <laughs> They just didn't get tickets in time. They're happy. <laughs> but there are still things that divide us. And today, I want to talk about the biggest controversy since this dress. Do you remember this? <laughs> All right, now, I personally see a gold and white dress. How many people see a gold and white dress? Okay. All, right. All right. How many people see a blue and white dress? <laughs> just screaming doesn't make more of you. It just, you just. <laughs> Just an arm up help, helps. All right, how many of you heard, have heard of this Laurel and Yanny thing? Okay. All right, not the comedy duo. They stopped touring years ago. The old Yanny and Laurel. All right, I'm talking about the viral sound that is tearing the nation apart. Listen carefully to this, and then you're going to tell me if you hear Laurel or Yanny. Laurel. 
Laurel. Laurel. Laurel. Okay, how many people here, Laurel? How many people here, Yanni? Again, yelling does not make more of you. You still are not as many people as the correct people, which are Laurel. It is Laurel. It's Laurel. Now, Laurel, it's so easy, it's Laurel. So mo more, mo more of you hear Laurel. The people who hear Yanni, I'm, I'm gonna have to ask you to leave because uh, <laughs> it's crazy though, isn't it? I mean, we can hear the exact same thing and then hear something completely different. Uh, how many of you have husbands and you tell them to take the trash out and put the dishes away and they hear, have a beer and take a nap? <laughs> yeah. Totally same thing and yet they hear it. So this morning, <laughs> This morning I heard something that blew my mind even more. Okay, I'm gonna play a clip. Listen carefully to this. All right, now I'm gonna play a different clip. The juice of lemons makes fine punch. Now I'm gonna play the first clip you heard. It's like a horror movie, isn't it? Clearly you could hear the juice. <laughs> the juice of lemons, right? Makes fine punch. At first you just hear static, but then the brain knows what to listen for and then you hear it. Apparently it comes down to pitch and the power of suggestion. And I think that's a good lesson to remember because you know there are times that we're gonna disagree and it doesn't matter who's right and who's wrong and what makes you better is really listening to somebody else as long as they hear Laurel. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna randomly point to someone right now and see if they agree with me. Um, sir, in the... In this video, we have seen Plato's paradox. How come we know so much with so little evidence? How come we know so much with so little evidence. And we saw how this applies to different fields of core linguistics. We saw how it applies in phonetics, in phonology, in morphology, in syntax, in semantics, and in pragmatics. We also saw how it applies when we move to uh, the visual system and also the auditory system. So we see that this is going to be the central question in theoretical linguistics. This is the question we're going to try to answer in our course.